Let's jump into uh, chapter 16. <clears throat> One thing I might say about 16 is that uh, when we get uh, about halfway through 16, we will be halfway through the text of A Course in Miracles. So we, we started this uh, in May of 2013, and we're, we're halfway through at this particular juncture, or by, by the time we get through today, right? <clears throat> I'd like to really make some preliminary comments based upon this chapter before we actually start reading some of the passages from the chapter. Uh, this uh, chapter was taken down by Helen uh, in the end of December and the beginning of January. I'm not sure, probably 1969. I'm, I'm kind of guessing that was about the time that, that she was at this particular juncture. Uh, so there are several interesting references to this year. Uh, in chapter 16, so you're, it's obviously happening at a, at a new year. And I wanted to start, and if you want to go along with me, you have notes. We make up these little booklets <clears throat> every time. <clears throat> this is just sort of a, a guide or an outline to what we're going to be going through. <clears throat> sometimes I stick pretty close to this, and sometimes I don't. And somewhere, we've never been able to finish one, so you'll have extra <laughs> to read at the end. <clears throat> but we try as much as we can. So I'll begin by reading this passage from uh, chapter 16. It says, this year, determine. <laughs> okay. I underline the word determine, all right? This year, determine not to deny what has been given you by God. Awake and share it. For that is the only reason he has called you. Now, the, the, you're going to find a lot of emphasis in the Course upon, you know, determine, declare, decide, make the commitment. You know, we got we to gotta do this. It, it's, it's, it's not something that we can just do passively or, or part-time. It, it has to kind of become a commitment to us. How many of you started doing the, the workbook lessons, by the way, at the beginning of January? Okay, so I see like seven hands or so on that eight hands. Do I hear nine? I got nine. Do I hear ten? Ten, ten, ten. I got ten. Eleven anywhere? Okay. Uh, <laughs> so several of you have started it. I started it uh, again. It takes me about every two years to get through every session. But so this was a time to start again. And by the way, in case you didn't know, there's a fun way to do it. And, and Brad and I have been doing this. And if you want to ask me to send you the link to this, I will. There's a, a friend of mine. Uh, Jimmy Twyman. Anybody know Jimmy Twyman? Anyhow, Jimmy has put the Course in Miracles to the, the workbook lessons to, to music. Uh, at least the headings are, are in, you know, to be sung, right? And so you can turn this on on your computer in the morning and you can listen to him singing the inter or chanting, you know, chanting the introduction, and then he reads whatever's in the text, and then they chant it again usually, and then there's a little commentary on it. It's just kind of a fun way to, to do it. You can sit there with headphones on and listen to it, or, or I do yoga while I listen to it. It's just a just, just fun way to do it, right? And it sticks with you that way. I sort of find myself singing the lesson in the shower, which is kind of a nice way to be, begins to kind of come ingrained in you by, by putting it to, to music, right? John, yes? The, the, the website to sign up is ACIM Revival. Right. Yeah, so you don't have to depend on me. And it's, it's incredible. Yeah. Can you repeat that one more time? ACIM uh, Revival. Revival. Okay. All right. So actually, and part I want to talk about today is, are the beginning lessons? Uh, so if you were doing it, then you know, today you would be up to uh, lesson 11. And let's just, I want to just make a comment about these early lessons. All of these early lessons from the workbook, uh, as you start to do them, they may not make any sense at all. And that's fine. Uh, don't worry about the fact that they don't make any sense at all. Uh, because before we can do anything by way of constructing, we have to do some deconstructing. You know, if you're going to remodel a house, uh, first thing you got to do is go in there and tear out the old plumbing and the wiring and stuff like that. Well, 
you know, here it is, we're talking about retraining the mind so that we begin to see things in a wholly new way. So these early lessons are all lessons that are actually destructing, and not, not in a negative sense of what that means, but, but so that we can begin to build anew. So we start off with, I'm going to, let me go through the first 10, 11, all right, just very, very briefly. Nothing I see means anything. Now, the, what, that doesn't make any sense at all, right? And it certainly doesn't make any sense on the ego level. But when you get to two, that we begin to clarify that. I have given whatever I see all the meaning it has for me. So now I'm bringing the definition into it. So nothing has any meaning except for the meaning that I give it. And whatever meaning I give it, it it's going to be different depending upon the, the, what you're looking at and what it is that you're... So let's say, for example... Uh, that uh, George here is looking at a picture of his wife, okay? Now, the meaning that it has for George is totally different uh, for the meaning that it has for everyone else, right? Uh, they see a, a nice-looking lady, but George has all kinds of uh, feelings and emotions and connections. And <laughs> okay? so, but that's what it means. I, wh whatever I see, whatever meaning it has is the meaning that I'm giving it, right? Now we go on to number three is, I don't understand anything I see, right? And I don't understand anything I see because, because I'm giving it the meaning that, <laughs> that I think that it has for me. I'm throwing all that information in there. And then we go a little deeper to these thoughts do not mean anything. Now we're actually going to get to a place in, in this lesson today where the Course is <laughs> going to emphasize the fact not only do these thoughts not mean anything, but that they really don't mean anything. <laughs> but then, I mean, the Course talks, for example, about how our thoughts can become preoccupied. Like we, we get a kind of loop going in our mind, a projective thought or an attack thought, and that seems to be really meaningful and important to us, but as a matter of fact, it's just a fantasy. It's really part of the illusion of the world that we're seeing, and there's actually a point in there where the Course says, actually, if your mind is just kind of preoccupied with something, it's actually blank. <laughs> now that sounds like, that sounds pretty rough, right? But it really just means that it doesn't mean anything. It doesn't mean, in the long run, it doesn't mean anything. It doesn't mean anything other than the meaning, again, that you've given to it. And then along with that, I am never upset for the reason, I think, right? Now we're up to lesson uh, five, all right? So if I get upset about something, then I can only get upset about it. <clears throat> um, Christian, I, you don't mind, I'm not going to use your illustration, but just uh, there was just interpersonal relationships, uh, husbands with children, <coughs> wives, you know, we can get upset about whatever it is that we're seeing that, that, that's going on and throws... To another person, it doesn't mean anything at all. Sometimes, you know, you'll see somebody getting upset. You wait, what, what do you get upset for? This is this is nothing. You know, you're making you're making something. You're literally making something out of nothing. All right? Looks like we are. We are actually because it doesn't mean anything. I'm upset because I see something that's not there. Now, when he says that's six, so if I'm upset when I see something that's not there. It's because I'm I'm putting whatever it is that I see. I'm I'm upset with somebody because I think that they're lying. <clears throat> but I'm the one that's upset, and seeing how I'm the, I'm, I'm, and <laughs> all I got to do is change my mind about this. It doesn't mean that I, I, I erase the fact that they're lying. I just, it does, it doesn't have to make a difference to me. All right, it, it is what it is in that sense. All right. Um, seven. I see only the past. I see only it, that's in everything. Like again, when George looks at his wife. You know, he sees the, the it's the past. They, they have a relationship. They've had a long, long-term relationship, right? So there's all kinds of feelings that are going on in terms of the past that I see there. If this is somebody that's holy, no, I don't have any of these kind of feelings, right? My mind is preoccupied with past thoughts. You know, we're up to, to eight. I'm going to talk about eight a little bit more in a moment. Uh, nine and ten, I see nothing as it is now. That's because I only see the past in whatever it is that I'm seeing, right? And my thoughts do not mean anything. Right? Remember, um, I, I'm, a couple of times today, I'm probably going to quote the last line from Lesson 52, which I, I like so much, which is, this is something you say to yourself. Would I not rather join in the thinking of the universe 
than to obscure all that's really mine with my, and here's the great line from the Course, my pitiful, meaningless, private thoughts. <laughs> the Course is a little heavy at that point, right? My pitiful, meaningless, private thoughts. You know, what? I, but that, that's what they are. You know, they're just they're sort of pitiful, meaningless, private thoughts. I think they're so darned important that I can get all upset and annoyed and everything about these thoughts, but they're just thoughts. And they're not, they're not actually obviously coming from God. They're not uh, divine thoughts. They're very clearly examples of where the ego is getting caught. And then just uh, up to today, my meaningless thoughts are showing me a meaningless world. Right? So we want to change that. So um, let's read the, on the bottom of uh, the first page. This year is thus the time to make the easiest decision that will ever com comfort you and also the only one. You will cross the bridge into reality simply because you will recognize that God is on the other side and nothing at all is here. Nothing at all is here. So the only thing which is meaningful, the only thing which is true is heaven. Now that doesn't mean that I can't exceed, you know, experience heaven here and now. I can experience heaven here and now. Right? It is impossible not to make the natural decision <clears throat> as, is, as this is realized. Lesson in the beginning of the course, principle number six of the 50 miracles principles. The miracles are natural. When they do not occur, something has gone wrong. So most of our thinking is really unnatural thinking because we're seeing problems and difficulties in the world. So this is, of course, in mind training or reworking the mind. So we're going to get around to the point where actually everything should become perfectly natural. So the decision-making, for example, is not even difficult because you will just you will know the right response, because you will know how to choose in line with the way that God would see it. Do you have this little uh, chart that I made up inside your bulletin there this morning? You might want to look at this little chart. <clears throat> Did I share this maybe a few months ago? I don't know, somewhere along the way? No? Okay, then I made it up for a different class. But <laughs> it's, so let's just look at this uh, for a moment. What the Course is saying, there is a perfectly natural way to realign the mind back with the mind of God. The problem with us uh, human beings is that we kind of wander all around the place. Sometimes we can get the mind realigned. That's what we talked about last time as a holy instant. A holy instant is one of these experiences in which we are feeling what we're trusting. With everything is working out. It's, it's fine. We're, we're being loving in the real sense of what it means to be loving. We're doing what, we're, what, what God is asking us to do. We're following a natural path. Remember the line from the Bible, straight is the way, narrow is the gate that leads into, and it's very interesting where it leads into. What does it lead into? It leads into, anybody want to say it? No. No. But you're close. Oh, it doesn't. I'll tell you. <laughs> it's, but actually, the words that you're using are synonyms. Okay. It says, straight is the way and narrow is the path that leads into life. Life. Right? Few there are that go therein. Right? Broad is the way. Wide is the path that leads into where? Destruction. Many there are that go therein. Right? So all egos eventually are going to fall apart. I mean, all egos are going to collapse. It's built. They have a, they have, all egos have a built-in implode. It's just inevitable that, that at some point it's all going to crash. It's it's all going to end. You know, if it doesn't end before, it'll it'll end at the point at which you uh, realize that you've got to let go of this insane ego. If nothing else, it'll happen when we die, right? That just because that's not you. It's the story that you've made up, the drama that you've made up, all that stuff that you've been making up is not reality, right? It's just a part of the fantasy. But the fantasy is the this illusion. The course calls it the dreaming of the world. So we get very caught in this dreaming of the world. But there is this straight way. What the course is trying to help us to do, and 
Helen said this very clearly. It's trying to help us to get to the point where we are listening only to one voice. And that only that one voice is the voice for God, which the Course describes as being the voice of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit only has one function. And that function is communication. So it's as though you are constantly being beamed, so to speak, being given the right information. The only question is, are you willing to receive? Are you willing to hear? Can you hear the right information, or would you prefer to be kind of all caught up in this ego chatter, ch -ch 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 stuff that's, that's always going on in the back of the mind? And we kind of, we entertain that a lot. You know, as we're driving our cars, as we're walking down the street, we're just doing that kind of ego chatter stuff, which means that we're paying more attention to that. And we're not really listening to the guidance that's really there available for us. Let's go on a little bit further with this on to the next. So Bridge to the Real World. Now, the Bridge to the Real World is a section in this chapter, which is one of my favorite sections in the, in the whole course. I'm, when we get around to it, which will probably not be until during the second part of our time this afternoon, I actually want to read a page or two from that straight through because it's so important. The bridge is a symbol. It's a symbol of, first of all, there's two parts to a bridge. By two parts to a bridge, I mean there's one way and there's the other way we go, right? So the Course is saying that we've, we've crossed a bridge, if you will. We came across, that we came from heaven. We came into this world. And having come into this world, we now have forgotten about our origin. We have, we've really forgotten where we came from. We, we, we buried it. We buried it very, very deeply. And we, the, the, the thing that buried it is the ego. And the way that the ego buried it, because it, it doesn't want us to, to look at this, it doesn't want us to look at the truth of the reality of who we are, because if we did, that would be the end of the ego. So it's going to keep it. So it's going to build up its own world. It's going to create its own fantasy. And what, there used to be a song, I think I'm living in a fantasy world. Was it, That's a line from a song somewhere or another. When I used to hear that song, I think, yes, definitely. You're living in a fantasy world. <laughs> Something about romance. You know, romance is often a lot of fantasy uh, connected with that. Right? We're not really, really living. But then there's another bridge. I mean, it's the same bridge, but it's the bridge home, the bridge back. And the, so the Course is trying to serve as a bridge for us to enable us to get back home. I remember once, years and years and years ago, I had Ken Wapnick at my home, and I was sponsoring a workshop. This is when I lived in Katona back in probably about 1980. And um, we were just chatting for a while, and he, I said, I'm working on a book. And he says, what it's on? I says, he said, what's it called? And I said, Bridge to the Real World. I said, it's a line from the Course in Miracles. He said, yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, he came up with the title. <laughs> He's the one that went through there and put the paragraph heads in, right? <laughs> but... This is what the, the Course is. It is this bridge, this bridge back to the real world. We're really trying to, to learn how to be able to, to cross in the, the right direction. But first, we've got to stop all the fantasy, all the pitiful, meaningless private thoughts, and all of the dreaming of the world, which is very, very strong in all of us. I read an interesting article this week in a, a Science of Mind uh, magazine, which is about... Um, confabulation, you know the word confabulation. It was it, the title of the article was "Honest Liars," and it's about people who create fantasy, but world they make up this world, but then they make it up so well that they actually believe it. I mean, they actually they're convinced that it, you know, like they were abducted by a flying saucer. And, you know, they had this life on the flying. And some people are so good at it that they don't even realize themselves. They forget that they made up this world. Well, that's kind of what we all do, is what the Course in Miracles is saying. We, all, we, kind of, we make up this world. We then think the world is real, and we forget that it's our construct. So one of the things the Course is trying to do very clearly is trying to help us to see 
you made this all up, this whole construct. That's why the beginning lessons are all these destruct lessons to take down the construct that you created so that we can begin on a level surface again to, to rebuild back up to what the truth really is. Right? So everybody lies, but uh, according to the article, and this is a well-researched article, uh, confabulators uh, are, are so good at it that like uh, psychopaths uh, might even be able to pass a, a lie detector test because they don't have a conscience. They're not, they don't, the feeling element is gone. They really think that the, the element happened. Now you can't, that's not true. I mean, there's, there's no lie that's gonna stay forever there. The truth eventually comes to the fore. It has to come to, because it's the truth. And the truth will be exposed at, at some point. That doesn't mean that we're exposing somebody. That doesn't mean that something has to be exposed. Actually, the truth is, the truth is you're the son of God. You're the daughter of God, if you prefer. That's the real truth that we're looking for. All that stuff really doesn't matter. All the stuff that we, we say, that bad stuff that makes that matters, but it doesn't. Now, that doesn't mean that we don't need justice, and that doesn't mean that we, we, we don't stop people who are doing hurtful things to other people, etc. But it also means that you don't have to go spilling your guts about all the terrible thoughts that you've had in your life, all right, about other folks. Going on down on, um, on two. The mind can make the belief in separation very real and very fearful, and this belief is the devil. And there's no such thing as a devil. <laughs> because the devil is just a, it's a belief. It's a concept, but if it... it I can make that very fearful, and I can make it very real, in which case it seems like it has some true vivacity for me, when it actually has no vivacity at all. Um, by the way, I noticed in the article said that there are certain people <clears throat> that are really good confabulators. Uh, one are chronic alcoholics, who can somehow make up <clears throat> so much of a fantasy world and, and tell a tell a lie as though it's a convincing thing that it's hard to, to, un, to know. Another, or believe it or not, I thought was sort of interesting, an article said, people who have an early set on Alzheimer's will also create a fantasy world that, they, that they're living in. And partly maybe it's, it's sort of something that's based on the fact. I have a good friend, uh, some of you, he sometimes writes articles in uh, Miracles magazines or little pieces. <clears throat> I don't think you'll mind my, my saying this. Uh, his name is uh, Dr. Rod Schelberg, who's uh, up in, uh, David knows him, <clears throat> up in Maine. And he, he's a most incredible doctor. Uh, he's in charge of uh, four nursing homes in Bangor, there's like 300 and some odd patients. So he means he's, he's writing death certificates practically daily. Uh, he's not the only one that's, he's not the only doctor that's there, but he's in charge of this thing. And he described to me one day how he walked into a room of Alzheimer's patients, and he could sort of psychically see that they, each of them had a kind of a loop that was going on in the mind, and how it was sort of a negative loop, or at least it wasn't a, you know, it wasn't getting them anywhere. Kind of a loop that the mind is going around and around and around, and then not and sort of locked in there and not being able to be, not being free, right? So imagine what that would be like. But we, some, we do that a lot. I mean, just you and I do that too and at other times. You get stuck on something, right? And you go over it and over, especially if you've got some sort of pro negative projection about someone that you're so sh damn sure of. And then, you know, that's just making you ill. It's making you sick. Now, most of us can get out of that. But the, the, one of the benefits of the course is it helps us to get out of it faster. So the, the, the minute that you see that you're starting to get into a loop, you can get out of the loop quick before it becomes uh, ingrained, literally, in the mind. Let's go to the top of uh, three. <clears throat> Every fantasy illusion, be it of love or hate, deprives you of knowledge. For fantasies are the veil behind which truth is hidden. To lift the veil that seems so dark and heavy, it is only needful to value truth beyond all fantasy. So that's where we're going in the course. We're going for the truth. 
and to be entirely unwilling to settle for illusions in place of truth. So instead of these fantasy stories that we create for ourselves, we're coming up with a new vision. The new vision is <laughs> that you are a son of God, that you are the Christ, as a matter of fact, and you see things the way Jesus does, you see things the way the Holy Spirit does, you see things correctly, you see things in alignment with the mind of God. So back on that chart, the alignment is that center part, the, the straight part. Another way to talk about that, by the way, is uh, any philosophy students here? Uh, Aristotle, in his, <clears throat> in his work on he called the golden mean, he talked about the golden mean as being a, a centered state of mind that we, could, we should really strive for. And it would be a, a centered state that's between extremes. <clears throat> by between extremes, I meant extent the the two extremes that we can get caught in are the negative or the positive. Or the, for example, you see yourself as being a victim or you see yourself as being a victimizer. Those are the two, two extremes, right? The middle point is you're neither a victim nor a victimizer, right? Uh, courage, for example, Aristotle said, was a centered state between two extreme states, one of cowardice, that would be the victimizer, or the victim, right? And the, uh, and the other state would be kind of profane boldness. Or uh, like, for example, is it courageous to drive a race car really quickly around a, or is that just insanity? <laughs> you know, are, you know is, the, is the ego getting, if it wins, it's going to get really excited, but then you're putting your life at risk in the process here. You know, maybe you're going, maybe that's a little too crazy to be doing something. It, Lots of analogies you could use like that. But it's a centered state that we're in. We're not into this one extreme or another. So this is, has to do with, with fixating on the past. Let's go to the bottom of three for a moment. I've been reading an, a new book. I'm always enjoying uh, comparing the Course with other ways of seeing the same kind of thing that the Course in Miracles is talking about. And it doesn't have to be a book that's related directly to the Course. This one that I've, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of these ideas because they're perfectly in keeping with This is called One Mind uh, by Dr. Larry uh, uh, Dossie, right? And the Course in, isn't mentioned in here once. But the ideas are very similar to something that the Course in Miracles is talking about. This goes back to this idea of the thinking of the universe. He says that there's a kind of mind, and it, he's, you know, the fact that he's come across this is not, there's nothing new about this. He's got a tremendous amount of information, all kinds of research that he's done to show that there is just one mind. I remember just kind of going through my own little evolution here, uh, reading Maurice Buck's Cosmic Consciousness. Anybody read? This is a really old book. It was written in 1901, to give you an idea. He was, uh, Maurice Buck was in charge of uh, uh, two, uh, in, well, at that time they called them insane asylums, <laughs> uh, up in Canada. <clears throat> he was a, a good friend of Whitman's, by the way, and he had Whitman uh, actually come up there and try to help him to do some work. There's a beautiful movie that's made about the two of their lives. Maybe you can look it up online. It's called Beautiful Dreamer. A beautiful Dreamer, which is really about Whitman, but it's about the two of them and their relationship. And <clears throat> so cosmic consciousness was about people that he thought had reached this level of mind which so transcended the ego frame of mind that it was actually a kind of mind in which minds were, were joined at a higher level. Right? And then after that, I read Emerson's The Oversoul. And that goes, that's what Emerson was talking about as well, a, a kind of mind that transcended the ego mind that was just one mind, if you will, right? And then after that, I read Pierre Tillet de Chardin's The Phenomenon of Man. Anybody know about The Phenomenon of Man? Oh, okay, good. Vincent. Um, this was back in the early 60s, and I came across... Um, 
a, a project that was called the Phenomena of Man Project. So I went to a lecture where they were showing slides about the work of Pierre Tillet de Chardin. I just want to tell you a little bit about his work and where this is going. Chardin was a French Jesuit priest, uh, anthropologist, uh, paleontologist, uh, archaeologist. It was all combined into to one. He was in on the discovery of Peking Man. And he got into what he called uh, the evolution of consciousness theory regarding the evolution of consciousness. Now, this ran counter to the Catholic Church. So they forbid his books to be published. And of course, guess what happened? Everybody wanted to know what the books had to say. <laughs> so he became very, very popular. <laughs> Despite the fact that the, the church would not let his books be published, they got out. Right, and people started reading them, and he was talking about a, a kind of evolution that he thought was occurring in consciousness, in part because there's more and more people on the planet, which was coming together. We're all getting closer, really, more closely packed together, and also because of technology that enables us to get closer together. Now, the thing about strange about Teilhard is that he died in 1955. And what he was talking about was a net of consciousness or a web of consciousness, right? Now, there's no, you, he, you know, he lived in a time when the major me means of communication were the telephone, the telegraph, telewoman. And <laughs> bad joke, bad joke. <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't resist it. <laughs> and television, right? But that's true. And yet we made that, it came real. It became real and electronically this is true. But there is something wonderful about the fact that we're sort of connected in the way that we're connected so that a hiccup doesn't happen in one part of the world that the rest of the world doesn't find out about it almost instantaneously, right? Which is sort of brings us all together in terms of feeling. But now the point that we're getting to is that what he's saying is there's a level of mind. This is not physical. In fact, is look on the top of four. <clears throat> First of all, uh, Paul Brunton. Anybody know Paul Brunton? Paul Brunton? Good. One, two. Do I hear three? <laughs> Paul Brunton <clears throat> is responsible. He's credited with being the first <clears throat> Westerner to bring yoga to the West. I mean, to, yeah, he was from Britain, but uh, he went uh, to India. He spent some time there. Uh, he spent some time with uh, Ramana Maharshi in particular. And although uh, actually uh, Paramahasa Yogananda and Vivekananda are the ones who really brought yoga to the West, he's the, the, the Westerner who brought yoga to the West. And the whole Vedanta philosophy as well, brought the Vedanta philosophy to this part of the world. It isn't that it wasn't known, but it was so unknown by most people. It wasn't Thoreau and Emerson were reading uh, the Bhagavad Gita and stuff before. People didn't even know that, that they existed, right? So um, his, his quote is, the brain does not generate thought any more than a wire generates electricity. And then the Course of Miracles says, you believe the body's brain can think, but you, if you but understood the nature of thought, you could but laugh at this insane idea. The brain is nothing but a mechanism. Just like the body is a, a learning device and the brain is a part of the body, it actually has nothing to do with the mind. And of course, it's very clear about this. <clears throat> the body is in the mind, the mind is not in the body. Uh, we, we, need to get, we need to get it straight, okay? So that's what the one mind is that Dossie is talking about. And there's lots of illustrations of this. I wanted to, if I could today, but I wasn't able to work it out, I wanted to show you uh, something from YouTube. But you go home, look it up on you, look up starling murmuration. Now, maybe you're not familiar with the word murmuration. It's spelled M-U-R-M-U-R-A-T-I-O-N, murmuration, right? And what it means, it means it's a flock of starlings. Now, this could also be a school of fish that we're talking about here. But it'll, if you look at it, they'll show you some pictures 
of where we have hundreds of thousands, hundreds of thousands of starlings that are all flying together. They do it every evening for about a half hour before dark over these moors in England. That's one that you can find on uh, YouTube. And they can form these incredible patterns. It's all done spontaneously. Like, you know, one moment it's looking like a giant whale that's going through the air, and then another it looks like a hurricane or a, or a tornado, and then it looks like a paisley print, and then it looks like something else that God only knows what it looks like. But what's interesting about it is that the way that they, these changes, the, the tip of the wing that has to turn happens, they, they, they measure this down within fractions like a fifteenth of a second, right? Like of a fifteenth of a second, that, these little twists and turns, right? So the question is, where's, where's the mind behind that? Who, who's giving, you know, it's not, there's not one bird in there that's saying, okay, everybody, go right. Okay, everybody, go left. <laughs> you know, it, it, it happens to be this absolutely, and not only, it's so complicated and so intricate, and there's so many, and no two birds ever collide. You know, it's like no two fish in a school ever collide. There are multiple, multiple demonstrations of this, whether it's herds of buffaloes or whether it's, uh, it, it's the same kind of situation. What we're saying is that there's a mind. There's a mind there which is not a physical mind. The Course in Miracles is saying the same thing. And not only is there a mind, there is one mind. It's only one mind. And here's the good news. You're a part of that mind. You've always been a part of that mind, but that's not the way the ego sees it. The ego sees that it's a separate mind. It's broken off or it's split off. And the ego has said, no, I, I, I'm going to fly over this way. You know, I'm going to go, but you don't go. <laughs> and not only that, there's no thought involved in this process. That's the important point, <clears throat> right? By thought, I mean, it's not like, it's not like there's words. It's just something that will happen. It's more like a dance. That's why you kind of look at these, the starlings and you see that it's just like this beautiful, beautiful dance that they're doing together, completely choreographed, not by anyone or anything, but it's just, it's just happening. It's just happening in this beautiful, this c connected sense of the, uh, uh, it becomes like a holy instant. But it's a shared holy instant. And that's what's... Yeah. A, the, Again, the Course says, divine abstraction, that's God, takes joy in sharing. You ever like to dance with a really good dance partner? I mean, somebody who kind of really just kind of, you don't have to talk to each other about, you know, you just sort of work together so well that it's just, that you get a lot of joy out of it. There's a lot of joy in dancing with somebody who's synchronizing with you and you don't you're not thinking about it you're not talking about it but it's working it's just working he gives an illustration here there's so many illustrations here there's just one it's just packed with, with illustration of near-death experiences that people have uh, here's one that I just last night the last thing I read before closing the book um, <clears throat> He tells a story of a, a woman who has a dream that a friend of hers is going to be killed in an automobile accident. And she's afraid to tell the friend about the dream, but even though it was quite vivid. And then, lo and behold, the woman is killed in an automobile accident. So she now goes into a great deal of grief over the fact that she never told her friend, never warned her about the automobile accident, right? So then later, this friend appears to her in a dream <laughs> and tells her, no, that was, you weren't supposed to tell me. This was exactly what was supposed to happen. You know, and nothing, nothing, there's nothing wrong. Don't, there's no reason to feel guilty. Uh, I'm, I'm wonderful. <laughs> I'm fine. I want to read you this last line of what's the, this is the, her friend is telling her, right? Um, <clears throat> I wanted nothing more than to help others to realize that we are still connected with our loved ones in spirit, she said afterwards. And there is, and this is what the Course in Miracles says, there is no separation. So if there is no separation, 
I mean, there is no division. So in that same sense, too, if you got the little Christmas greeting I sent out, and what I was saying in there is with our loved ones, quote, our loved ones, there's no separation. Not if it's, not if it's real, not if it's real love. Whether they're, whether they're here in this world or not, whether they've already passed from this world, it doesn't make any difference. And within the physic, because the physicality of the thing isn't what reality is. Physicality is not reality. That's what the Course in Miracles is saying, right? It's very clearly that this, the real thing is the mind behind the thing. But we get trapped in thinking that the world is real. The body is real. Our relationships are so screwed up and important and real in that sense. And it's true that that we are all connected, and it is real in that sense, but not not in the material sense of what we often think about. So this is kind of exciting stuff, right? I mean, because, and and don't you actually feel a bit of a relief (laughs) over the fact that we all get to go home. We all, the whole course is about just remembering this. Or the first passage I read for you this afternoon from the course there was awake. It had the word awake in it. You know? We awake and realize that this is true. That there is just one mind here. And again, it's not involving words. Go to page 7 in your, uh, your outline. <clears throat> the course <coughs> says, God does not understand words. For they were made to s- buy separated minds to keep them in the illusion of separation. Now, words themselves are also physic- physical things. So a written word is a physical thing, and a spoken word is a physical thing because it's a sound vibration that goes out into the world. We're talking about another level where there's no words involved at all. And I was thinking about the story of the, the Tower of Babel from uh, the, the Bible. Let's read this. It's, uh, I picked it out from Genesis. <clears throat> it's on the bottom of 7. The people said to one another, let us make a name for ourselves. Now, that's an interesting thing that they said, right? Let us make a name for ourselves. That's the ego, right? <laughs> was the ego say, let me make a name for myself, right? Let me, let, me, let me stand out from the crowd. Let me be different, right? Right? And let us make a tower whose top will reach to heaven. This is a physical thing they're doing. They're going to build a tower. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one. It's one. There's one mind, right? And they have all one language. And this they begin to do? (laughs) In other words, to separate, to segregate, right? This is but the start of their undertaking. (laughs) Right? And nothing will restrain them from that which they imagine to do. And then, of course, they go off and uh, build a, or start to build a tower. And, of course, we know that without going on to the rest of it, it all falls down. And uh, then we have many languages. Another way of talking about many languages is that we have many constructs. We have many ideas. We have, many, we have separation. And then, you know, that's all, that whole separation in terms of, literally, in terms of this world, we have uh, cultures and, and different ways of believing and religions and different, so different ways of seeing. And now we decide that your way of seeing is such that I, I have the right to kill you because of the insanity which, which I have, but I think that you have. So I'm going to project it onto you. And I'm gonna, and then we get we get the whole world, and the whole world is, if you study it, it history, it's just one damn thing after the other. Right? <laughs> uh, it's just one war after another war, because we're seeing the difference. We're not seeing the similarities. If we can break that down to the point where we begin to realize that we're all just literally just one one here, then you couldn't possibly go attacking your brother because you see some separation or some difference. So apply that to our everyday, <laughs> our current situation, which is always the current situation. You know, this, this is the ego's world, and let, let's, 
and it will be the ego's world as long as it's this world. Because what the world is asking us to do is to eventually translate this into heaven. And you know how the world's going to end in terms of the Course in Miracles? It says it, it's not going to. <laughs> it says it will simply seem to cease to be. It will simply seem to cease to be. All right, now that's not destruction. That just means awakening from the dream. All right, so if you awaken from, from the dream, then the dream no longer seems to have that kind of that, that power over you that it did before because you, you'll realize it was just a dream. And there was nothing real about it. I think that's one of the, one of the really good reasons why. Uh, don't be afraid of dying. <laughs> you know, because all that, all that dying is really going to mean is an opportunity to become free of the, the limitations, actually, of a body and a world and space and time and words which separate and segregate rather than being able to, to bring us back into this memory. So if we can get our mind back, that's why the Course is trying to, we're really trying to raise our level of awareness. I've said several times, if you do this Course, what should happen is you'll be, should more and more and more and more find yourself giving more and more and more and more aware. Which means that you, then you see the insanity of the world and you make this very simple choice that you are not going to participate in that insanity. That you, you're not going to facilitate that process. Now you're literally, you, Brad, you said you read above the battlefield, right? So you, we literally are getting above the battlefield. So let me stop at this point. Uh, any questions before we take our break? <coughs> yes, Vincent. Um, <coughs> uh, when, you, when you said that uh, uh, we're not participating in this massive illusion, uh, we are participating in yeah, sure. Right. Death of the ego. Of the ego. Though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but that is 100 uh, percent of who we think we are. Um, and, 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 and the last thing is that when Einstein said that E equals M C squared, uh, he was saying that energy is matter, and matter is energy. Uh, energy is nothing moving at a high rate of speed. Uh, if you stop all energy, if you stop the electron from moving around the sun, the nucleus of the atom. Uh, if you stop all movement, everything would disappear. It wouldn't break down a component units. It would just disappear. Mm -hmm. We have no more substantive reality. And, 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 and modern physics is, is increasingly, and this is a quantum uh, theory of life, mm -hmm. um, uh, modern physics come to realize that we have no more substantive reality than a hologram. Right. Uh, and, and so, so uh, uh, you know, I, I grant you that on one level, you know, this is all illusory. But on the level on which you and I have to interact, uh, uh, it's not illusory at all. You mean right now? That's right. <laughs> right now. Yeah, in this moment. Yeah. Yeah, in, in this moment in space time, right. But we're trying to get our minds up to the point where we're recognizing that there's something which transcends the illusory moment that's going on. Uh -huh. And that we're really part of that. Because at what point then do we leave this moment that you and I are having and we go to that transcendent? Well, is it, if it's just a matter of my mind getting to the point where I can see that, so if it's just that, right, then why can't we go there? In the mind, not, not, in, not in the physical way. I don't mean in the physical, literal, physical sense of that. Well, I do that when I meditate. Okay. Well, meditate's a good, a good illustration of that. Right, but that's the idea. We want to get to a place where we're living in a meditative state and not in an egoistic, trapped, antagonistic... In a meditative state and interact with you simultaneously. Right. Right. So you don't have to sit down and meditate to meditate. You're really meditating all the time. 
which merely means that the, the, the mind is at peace all the time. There's nothing that's driving me crazy about what's going on within the context of this world that I seem to be part of. Right? <laughs> okay, don't worry. About it. We'll, we'll talk more about it afterwards if you want. Uh, okay, two more. Uh, oh, we got mics. Yes, yes. Oh, I'm sorry. We did that whole thing without a mic. But maybe you got it. Okay. Well, I haven't. Yeah, I'll always turn it. Be sure it's on. It's on. It's on. Just get it close. Well, I haven't mystics been able to transcend yes, the of course. world? And sure. So they're an example of right. where we're all going. They're an example. Yeah, exactly. And then pass the mic back to Christian back there. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to comment on what you were uh, mentioning before about the swarm mentality of birds and fish. Right. In England, back in the 1950s, uh, milkmen would deliver milk to, to the house in glass bottles, and they had a little cardboard top on it. Right. The, the top had a little tab. And at a certain point, uh, people were complaining that their milk was arriving without the top, and half, half, uh, half the milk was gone. And what they discovered was the crows were watching <laughs> the milkmen, and they had figured out how to remove the top and would drink as far down as they could. Uh -huh. Within weeks, it was all over Europe. Uh -huh. Really, it traveled all over Europe, that, that uh, knowledge. Uh -huh. Now, again, that's the, you know, the grand mind once again at right. work. One of the best examples of the mind that, that um, Dossie talks about is a, is a well documented story from several years ago. There was a family that were from Washington State. They were vacationing in Indiana and they, they lost their dog. Their dog ran off somewhere or another and they couldn't find their dog. And they never did find their dog. And like four months later, the dog shows up, walks from Indiana to his house in uh, Washington State. I mean, at, at something like 1,800 miles. I mean, <laughs> how? Where's that knowledge coming from? That's that's the point that we're getting at. You know, where's this? Where's this knowledge? And it is knowledge, by the way. The, the course uh, uses a capital K when we're talking about knowledge on the higher level, not factual, not informational knowledge, but knowledge which is in alignment with the mind of God which transcends all these words that we're using to, to talk about. Bill, let's, 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 we're going to take our break. Yeah, supposedly, right. Right, right. Anyhow, it's time for our 10-minute break. We'll have you more questions when we come back. I'll get you to come back, okay?